Good evening and welcome to our evening worship service. We're glad that you're here. If you were not here this morning, please fill out an attendance card so that we can have a record of your attendance. I have a uh, long list of people, members of our congregation who either have had surgery and are recovering at home or still sick or anticipating surgery in the near future. Let me run through these real quick. Gerald Bean is at home following his uh, knee replacement surgery. Uh, Doris Harper still recovering at home. Johnny Faye Demar was here this morning. She's uh, at home recovering. Uh, Regina Hines also had back surgery last week and she's at home recovering. Eileen Christ is still in Murray Calloway County Hospital. Florence Robertson is back in Marshall County Hospital. Okay, let's see. Uh, Bob and Jenna Pogue have been moved to the Stilly House. They are in room 108, if you want to go by and see them. Rosa Bennett will have surgery Wednesday this week at the Greenview Hospital in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Roger Jarrett is uh, in room 321 at Superior Care in Paducah. And our sympathy is extended to the families of, uh, well, to Katrina Estes, who lost her uncle, Robert Dismore, and to T Tony Darnell in the passing of her grandfather. And we're so very thankful to see Judy Atkins back with us tonight. She's been gone for a long time and, and uh, has been struggling with some health issues, and I want to read this thank you note. Thank you so much for all the good things that you have done for me in the last six months. For all the cards, visits, cards, calls, flowers, and mostly for Jerry, Sue, and Mary. Also, Sonny, take, I didn't know that was in there. Also, Sonny taking me to doctor's appointments. I have been dealing with five different doctors because I had five different things to happen to me in various ways of sickness. Thank you again. Love to all Judy Atkins. She's been struggling, but we're glad to see her back. Okay, um, now there are some events coming up that you might want to participate in. Ladies, there's going to be a, uh, a Women of Hope Conference in Lebanon, Tennessee, March 3rd and 4th. There's going to be a father and daughter uh, day on March the 17th here. It's an evening, actually, at 6 p.m., that's for fathers and daughters to come and, and uh, have fun together, uh, have a potluck together, and some uh, arts and craft stuff they're going to do together. So that's a good event for fathers and daughters to connect and build their relationship. Also num next summer, this coming summer, in July the 2nd and through the 7th at Freed Hardeman University, an event called Horizons. It's a week-long spiritual experience for teenagers, grades 7 through 12. Uh, we encourage our young people to consider going to this, and uh, the elders have agreed to pay half of the enrollment fee for that week that they would spend there uh, living in a dorm and attending classes on, on the campus. And... Uh, Another event that we all want to uh, try to attend is a, it's actually a movie on Thursday, February the 23rd, 7 p.m. at the Cinemark Theater in Paducah. It's a, a movie by the Apologetics Press folks, and uh, the title is Is Genesis History? It's uh, deal, it would deal with the accuracy of the historical information presented in the book of Genesis. And this is a one-time showing, so you only get one chance to go. That's Thursday, February the 23rd at 7 p.m. And the last thing I have is that uh, Kendall met with the elders a while ago and just informed us that this is a special week, actually, that it was 25 years ago this week that the government of Benin issued a permit or a certification corporation certification for the Church of Christ in Benin. First time ever for the Church of Christ in Benin. 25 years ago this week. So that's a great celebration. And uh, 
We also want to say a, a great word of thanks to those of you who have contributed to that work. It's just amazing how that work has grown. Uh, God has blessed that in so many ways and uh, been a lot of hard work by George and all of his people over there. But uh, it would not have been possible without financial support from people like you, and we commend you for that. And uh, one th final thing, uh, I tried to kid Kendall about his honeydew list getting longer since Sandra has retired, officially retired now. But he, he claims that he doesn't have any problem with honeydew lists, so I don't know about that. But anyhow, we want to congratulate Sandra on her retirement. 32 years, was it? Yeah, 32 years. And uh, now you can, you can watch him closer now. Okay, Jim's going to lead us as we sing together in worship. Five hundred and fifty five. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, singing Alleluia, Alleluia. Ask and it shall be And ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you, singing Alleluia, Alleluia. Man shall not live by bread alone, but What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a joy, says mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, say, and secure from all arms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning. to dread, what have I to fear, leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, say, and 
secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Six hundred and twenty-eight. 628. This will be our song um, for our lesson and our reading. Uh, so at this time, uh, we'll have our opening prayer. Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity you've given us to be here. We thank you for the church that meets here. We pray that you'll continue to be with us and we can grow stronger and our influence can be a positive one throughout the community. We pray for Mark as he stands before us, as he presents his lesson. We pray that we'll take these truths we'll out into our lives with our personal daily study and our friends, our community will see Christ living through each one of us. We pray for our youth. We pray that you'll be with those they go through school, pray that you'll strengthen them as they go through the temptations, the special temptations that they go through. We pray that each of us older ones can be the examples we need to be so they can look to us for guidance and see that they can get strength from us and, and maybe come to us and, and ask the questions that need to be answered. We pray for those many, many sick that's been mentioned. We pray for those who are going through treatments, those who are recovering from surgeries, those who are about to have surgeries, we pray that you'll be with them and they soon can be back to their proper places in life. We also pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray that you'll give them the special comfort that you can give and that they can be comforted through this. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll forgive us our sins. We know uh, many, many, many temptations out there. We know that sin's always trying to get us to attack us. We pray that you'll strengthen us and that you'll forgive us of the sins that we've committed as we repent and turn from them and, and help again strengthen us when these temptations come at our door. Pray that you'll be with us through the rest of this service and on through our lives. We ask this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let's be standing for this song and then we'll remain standing for our reading. If the name of the Savior is precious to you, if his care has been constant and tender and true, if the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell of your gladness today? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it today? If your faith in the Savior has brought its reward, if the strength you have found in the strength of your Lord, if the hope of a rest is his palace is sweet, oh, will you not rather the story read? Tell it today. Will you not tell it today? If the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it today? If the souls all around you are living in sin, if the master has told you to bid them come in, if the sweet invitation they never have heard, oh, will you not tell them the cheer-bringing word? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? 
if the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it today? Our invitation song will be 470. Scripture reading be from Matthew 5, verse 5. Again, Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. You can be seated. Good evening. It's good to see everybody here tonight. Glad that you're here. The folks, as we're going through our Sermon on the Mount on Sunday nights, the folks in the Beatitudes like me that have to read Scripture. But eventually we're going to get to verse 11 and you'll have to read three verses on the Sunday night uh, scripture reading. As I said, it's good to see everybody here today. Our numbers are a little bit down because so many people are sick. And uh, both of my sons have the flu. And so that's kind of an interesting thing to watch around our house. Uh, they haven't had a fever since Thursday. Nathan says he's well and he's moving around. Matthew is in bed watching Netflix, and I'm not sure if he's sick or just happy. Um, I'm not sure one way or the other exactly what's going on with him. But maybe in your family you've had some sickness, and a lot of people are dealing with those sort of things. So hopefully we'll all get well soon. I can't blame it on bad weather, at least not yet, but it is flu season that we have going on. Tonight what we're going to talk about is this idea of meekness. And exactly what we mean, and more importantly, what Jesus meant when he said, Blessed are the meek. And as you and I think about that, we think, well, you know, meekness, what does that mean to us today? And we can look it up in dictionaries, and what it talks about in a dictionary is power under control. And what it talks about in a dictionary is, uh, maybe as we would say it colloquially, going 80% instead of 100%. Being able to make sure that what we do, we do well. Maybe you live in the same world where I live, where you see people who are multitasking, and you'll be driving down the road and look across at somebody you're driving alongside with, and they're driving, and they're also on their cell phone, and they're also eating fast food, and they're also talking to somebody in the back seat. You ever seen somebody like that? Maybe they're doing two of those. Maybe they're doing three of those. Maybe they're doing four of those. Sometimes, amazingly, it seems like they're doing five or six or seven or eight or ten things going on all at the same time. And maybe in our life, sometimes we feel that way. We've got so much happening and so much going on that we take a step back and realize we're not doing anything that we're doing very well. I read an article by a friend of mine. He preaches outside of Nashville at the very end of last year, and as I read through it, I thought, you know, that applies to my life, and that's something I need to include in the things I do. And what his article was about was margins, and he actually used this passage as one of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, scriptures in his little bulletin article or lesson. People don't write bulletin articles anymore. I guess his blog, maybe that's what it was. And it was talking about the margins that he used to write in the, when he was back in school. And maybe you remember this. You remember back when you were in elementary school or junior high or high school, you know, way back in those generations past when people actually had to take notes on real paper and stuff. And he would talk about how he could look back in his notes and he would see himself writing. And as he would run out of space at the end, you know, you had that red line, he would keep going because he still needed to go a little further. And then as the end of that page would happen, he still needed to go, so he'd start writing sideways. And so... As you looked at the paper at the end, you saw where the lines and were going every direction because he, instead of doing that hard, difficult task of turning the paper over or going to the next page, he was just going to fit a little bit more on that line. How many of us tonight have a life where we feel that way? Where our lines don't just go that way and they sure don't stop at that red line margin they just keep going and going and going and they curl and everything else. And how many times, maybe as a Christian, do we feel that way? As I said before, this morning, twice, it's not that we're bad, it's just that we're busy. And oftentimes it's not that we do not want to do good. Sometimes it's just we don't have enough time or have enough energy or have enough power 
to do what God would have us to do. And so as Jesus is telling us how to live our lives tonight, as we read through these Beatitudes, we see where he says, Blessed are the meek. Now, if you got your Bibles, turn over to Psalm chapter 37. Chalm, uh, Psalm, Chalms. Psalms chapter 37. And oftentimes what Jesus does, as you and I read through the Gospels, is he will say one or two lines of an Old Testament passage, and what he's actually doing is he is referring to the entire chapter of what he's working with. If you recall, um, when he's being crucified, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And many of the people at that time were trying to figure out what he was saying. Some people thought he was quoting Elijah a little bit earlier and things such as that. What he's doing is he's using code and he's going back in, in shorthand, you might say. And he's quoting Psalm 22, which is a prophetic retelling of the crucifixion written 700 years before it happens. And he's going and telling everybody, read Psalm 22. That's what's going on at this very moment. When he's going through the uh, Sermon on the Mount, a lot of times he will throw out a beatitude or he'll throw out a short line of something. When We'll study it and it's good to study but we don't realize, because we're not as versed in the Old Testament as they were in those days, that Jesus is actually referring to an Old Testament passage. And so you'll get to Psalm 37, and you'll begin reading in verse 11, and what do you know? There is your beatitude as we look right there. And so what I want us to do in the lesson tonight is we're going to run through Psalm 37. We're going to look at verses 5, 6, 7, and 9. Nine's iffy, depending on if I have enough time. Margins. I've got to be quiet eventually. But um, we may get to nine, may not get to nine. But we're going to look at some of those passages there. But before we get started, let's talk about what we're not talking about when we talk about meekness. Sometimes people say, well, you're not supposed to be meek because we're supposed to have a high self-esteem. And a lot of times we'll speak about how we need to recognize we're God's child. And yes, that's very true. We need to realize how special we are. Yes, that's very true. We need to realize that God loves us. And yes, that's very true. But as you and I read through the New Testament, we see a bigger problem is that we get too filled with pride. And a big point about meekness is recognizing humility. That is, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and let He be the one who exalts you. Humble yourself before God and let Him lift you up. Cast yourselves before the Lord and He will raise you. And so as you and I look at that, we see that there is a level of esteem that we need to see, but it's more important for us to have a humility, a humility before God. A second thing is as we talk about an idea of humility or meekness, is that some people think that means that we look at ourselves and we see ourselves as worthless. And hopefully you're not that way. Sometimes we dwell on a mistake we've made in life or a shortcoming we've made in life or we dwell on our history or our past and we see how we used to be. And sometimes as we dwell on that, we realize, man, I cannot believe I would have ever done that or ever would have thought that or if that it was ever me. And we think, how can God love me if I acted that way? And why would anybody accept me if I was that way in my past? Much like what Paul says over in Timothy. He says, here's a faithful and worthy saying, worthy to be acceptable of all. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And what did he say? Of whom I am chief. I am the chief of all sinners, Paul would say. But as he recognized his sin in Acts chapter 9, he didn't just dwell in the pit, and didn't just give up. But instead, he listened to Ananias' preaching. He arose, he obeyed the gospel, and he began to teach others about the wonderful grace that had been taught to him. And so tonight, as we talk about meekness, don't spend your time in that pit, but instead recognize the love that God has for you and realize that meekness is needed today. Well, look there in Psalm 37, verse 11. You've got your Bibles open, and you're supposed to. This is church and all. Psalm 37, verse 11, But the meek shall inherit the earth, and they shall delight themselves in the abundance of the peace which God has given to them. That right there is a portrait or portrait of the meek. Look there in verse 5, if you will. We'll go back a little bit earlier. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. One thing you'll notice, and we don't have enough time tonight, but in your daily Bible reading or in your study or if you have opportunity this week, Spend some time going through Psalm 37. 
and look how it applies to life. What you'll see as you read this uh, psalm from David is this is something he's written when he is stressed out. And so if you ever have a time when you're stressed out, I know that doesn't happen to y'all probably, but if you ever have a time when you're stressed out, read Psalm 37. It talks about what to do when you're stressed out by other people. It talks about what to do when you're stressed out by all the busyness. It talks about what to do when you're stressed out by anxiety. And it talks about what to do when you're stressed out in your relationship with God. And David, as he's writing the psalm, is inspired by the Holy Spirit to talk about this idea of being stressed and dealing with stress and having your power, having yourself under the control of God. And so as you and I read there in verse 5, you see the idea of casting your care upon him, committing your way absolutely to him. I think that shows us the power of faith. And oftentimes we'll focus on the plan of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess the name of Christ and be baptized. And we focus on baptism, which is good, because baptism is at the point at which we're translated into the kingdom of Christ. I think maybe the most difficult part of the plan of salvation is repentance. Changing who we are, and instead of living for myself, I now live for God. That is something that's very, very difficult. But here David spends some time with the idea of committing to God, or the idea of what we'd call it today, faith. Hebrews 11, verse 6, Without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after Him. And so let's think about that real quick. In your life over this past week, how much trust have you placed in God? Yes, I realize that we have to be active. God has commanded us to act upon our faith. God has commanded us to take care of ourselves as much as is within us. But how much in this life, how much today are you trusting God to take care of you? Last week, I went up to Freed Hardeman, went to the lectureship, and got to hear a lot of good lessons. It was on the book of Daniel. But I listened to a man who was preaching, I think it was Monday night, and he said something, and I wrote it down in my notes, and I thought, someday I'm going to use this in a sermon. And it made it like four days until I used it. And here's what I wrote down God has not brought you this far to fail you now. Now, think about that. In your life, as you go through and see all the things that God has done and all the ways that He's shaped you and all the ways that He's blessed you, God has not brought you this far in your life to fail you now. And so we read here in verse 5 that we have an obligation to commit ourselves to God, to absolutely trust in Him, to lead us in the way in which we're going, to follow Him in everything that we need to do. But we also see there in verse 5 that we need to commit our way to Him. I like the Hebrew word for commit. And I'm not going to say it because you would say bless you. It sounds like a sneeze. But what it actually means, literally, if you bring it into our language, is roll. Roll with God. Kind of like you would roll along with somebody as a friend or something like that that would be. If you see a friend coming down the road and you want to roll with him, that makes you sound like you're in the 70s, doesn't it? But the idea of wherever God goes, I'm going to follow with him. Wherever God goes, I'm going to be right by his side. I know who he is. I know that I want to be with him. And so I'm never going to leave his side. And I'm always going to be right next to him wherever he goes. How committed are we to God? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You've got this memorized, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will guide or he will direct your paths. We've got to make a commitment to trust God, to have faith in our life. Matthew 6, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and then he'll take care of us. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, he says. Don't worry about what you're going to drink. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Trust God and he will see you through whatever it is that you face. Joshua was a man who learned to trust God. In chapter 1, we see four times where God came to him as the angel of the Lord. And he said, do not worry, do not be afraid. The Lord will be with you each and every day. Follow him. And so Joshua followed the Lord and conquered the entire country for his people. 
And as he had conquered the entire country, and as he, years wore on him, and as he neared the end of his life, notice what he told the people. In Joshua 24, 15, he said, Choose you this day who you're going to serve. Make a decision, make a commitment with who you're going to roll with, he would say. Is it going to be the God of the Egyptians? And of course, you know what happened to them. The God of the Pervites, the God of the Amorites, the God of the Canaanites. And of course, you know what happened to each one of those people. And he said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, meekness is gained when you truly trust God. But there's sometimes in my life, and maybe sometimes in your life, where we don't trust Him as much as we should. And a problem comes up and we think, I've got to fix it. And we begin resting on our own power. And a problem comes up and I think, I've got to worry about it. And I've got to be anxious about it. And I've got to be worked up about it. And yes, maybe I'll pray, but that's just a secondary thing. Because I am so worked up because my margins are at the very end. And I'm trying to see what I can do to overcome. God hasn't brought you this far to fail you now. And God will see you through whatever it is you face. Whether it be your health. Whether it be your fears whether it be your frustrations. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse, excuse me, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Be anxious in nothing, Paul would write, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, commit your way to God Trust in Him, and as you do it, you can know that God will see you through. Now skip down, if you will, if you're there in Psalm 37, all the way down to verse 7. And as we look at verse 7, we see the idea of being quiet for the Lord. Not quiet in church, quiet for the Lord. Rest in the Lord, David would write, and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in this way, because of the man who brings the wicked schemes to pass. Let's keep, keep going, verse 8. Cease from your anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret because it only causes harm. As you and I see here, we see the idea of being quiet and waiting for the Lord. Now, this is not the idea of laziness. Some people say, well, I'm going to trust God, and so I'm just going to sit back and let him do whatever in the world he wants to do. It's old, old preacher joke. And you've heard it a million times, so you don't even have to be polite and joke anymore, right? There's a man who's in a flood, right? And the water's come up all the way up to his roof, and he's sitting there, and he's praying. And, of course, you know, somebody comes by in a car, one of these big cars that can go through the water, and he says, hop in, I'm going to save you. And he says, no, I trust God. Later, a guy comes by in a canoe as the guy is knee-deep in the water. And he says, hop in, I'm going to take you to safety. And he says, no, I trust God. Water comes up to his shoulder. And as it's up to his shoulder, a helicopter comes by and throws down a rope and says, grab on. And he says, no, I'm going to trust God. And then he drowns. And he says, God, what in the world happened? And God said, I sent a truck, I sent a boat, and I sent a helicopter. What else do you want? Well, see, you've heard it before. Don't laugh. It's okay. I, I don't have an ego anymore. It's okay. What is it that we see there? It's not being lazy, but it's trusting that God will see you through. It's being diligent as we look at those things and knowing that God's going to see you through. And so that gives you a freedom from frenzy. Think real quick, Hebrews 11. Noah, by faith, built an ark. Abraham, by faith, took his son up on that mountain. Abel, by faith, offered a better sacrifice. And even though he died, yet his faith still speaks. There's 14 people in that chapter we could speak of. But what I want us to notice is each one of those people had faith, but they also acted. Now, they didn't act by their own power. They didn't save themselves by their own merits. But what we're talking about is they obeyed without the frenzy. Have you ever felt so stressed because you feel like you've got so many plates spinning? And as so many things are going on, you realize, I can't keep it all going. Something's going to fall. And it's always the most important things that fall down. It's always the most important things that fail. And so often, we end up becoming not who we want to be. We become who we have to be. Because we're caught up in the frenzy and caught up in the problems that are there. 
You see, there's a steadiness that has to come from life. There is a knowledge. Now, if you keep reading down a few more verses, it talks about dealing with anger, dealing with rage even, with people who've done wrong to you. And as you and I read about this meekness, we see very quickly the idea that sometimes you have to trust God and that God is going to see the end of the situation. Sometimes, let me change that, all the time, you have to know that God is going to take care of everything. There's a knowledge that comes by being a Christian. And that knowledge is this. God always wins. You ever notice that? God always wins. Now, maybe you've played checkers with somebody that's really good. And you think, okay, this time I'm going to go this way. This time I'm going to go that way. Whatever it may be. And no matter which way you go, you ever find somebody and they win every time. And you're like... Well, poo, you know, I'm trying to win this game. I can never win. Well, you come back in this other direction. That's the way God is in life. And I can determine to go this way. I can determine to go that way. I can determine to go whatever way it may be. God always wins. Jonah left his country and was going to go to a far land. And God caught him, didn't he? Jonah said, throw me to the depth of the ocean and let me drown. I will die before I obey God. And God formed a fish and vomited him out on the land. Jonah preached a very short sermon, hoping, praying, in fact. He actually prayed that the repentance would be short-lived so that Nineveh would be destroyed. Every time, God won. Now, lesson number one when we think about God always wins, is don't fight God. Roll alongside of him. But lesson number two, which is more applicable for tonight, is trust that God will always win. Trust that no matter how someone is wronged, you know, trust that no matter what's going on in life, that God will see you through. And the most important thing in life is not vengeance. The most important thing in life is not revenge. The most important thing in life is your soul. Don't be frenzied. But instead, keep that power under control. And put him first. You know the passage where I'm going to. Romans 12 and verse 19. My brethren, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath unto God. And trust that he will see you through. Trust that he will see these things. 37.7, don't fret over the wicked. The Lord is always in charge. John the Apostle was in a hard spot. He had just been thrown out of the church which he loved, the church at Ephesus. He was in exile. All of his brethren, the apostles which he had grown up with, had been put to death. Even his brother is the first one who has been beheaded. And as he sat out there on that, sit, on that island, and as he was all alone, the Lord came to him in a vision on the Lord's day. And he saw Jesus. But Jesus didn't look the same. He wasn't a regular person, as you might say. He had those flaming swords in his eyes and that tongue which had fire, and he glowed. And we see in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was, who is, and who is to come. I am the Lord God Almighty. What's God trying to tell John? Your world may be falling apart, John, but know that God's in charge. And your friends may all have disappeared, and your friends may have all met their end, but God's in charge. And you may be stressed and you may be worried about those whom you love. And you may feel like a failure sometimes. But God's in charge. And as you and I read through the book of Revelation, sometimes we may disagree on what some of that symbolism means. Sometimes we may have trouble figuring out why this beast would have a certain number of heads, a certain number of eyes, a certain number of horns. Don't get caught up in that. Because what God is telling us is that he always wins. Domitian, Nero thought that they ruled the world. God shut down that Roman Empire because God always wins. A lot of people politically think that they rule the world and they're full of pride and they're full of power. God in his time will shut down the world because he always wins. 
God will always overcome. You see, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20, I always laugh when I read that verse. Because Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 20, you know the song probably more than you know the verse, right? The song is, the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. You've heard that song? Okay, when I, the church where I grew up, the uh, song leader, always before church started, would start singing that song. He would sit in the front pew and he would sing that song. So I grew up thinking that that was God's start of church song. That the reason that that was in the Bible and the reason it was in the song book was, Mark, it's time for you to stop talking, because that's what I've always done in church. Stop talking and sit in your pew. It's time to start. The Lord's in this holy temple. We all got to get quiet. And that, that was always what I thought until I really studied the book of Habakkuk. You run into chapter 2, and what Habakkuk is finding out from God is God says, you know, you think you know how to rule the world. and You think you know all the things you need to know. God says, listen, I am the one in charge. I am the one seeking everything out, and I'm the one that's going to fix every problem that's out there. Your job is to be quiet and to obey. God's is, God is in his temple, which, by the way, was about to be destroyed. God is in his temple, and he is going to accomplish what he wants. Tonight, we can quote that verse. The Lord's in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent, because we have meekness or power under control. We may fret against these enemies. We may be upset with the way things are going. We may feel that we're wronged and we look at our political system and we think, what in the world has happened? God's in his temple. And our job is to trust him. Our job is to love him. Our job is to roll or to commit to him in every single thing that we face. In verse 8, it says there in that very beginning of that verse... Knowing that God is in charge, our job is to, see those first three words? Cease from anger or dissipate from your anger. It's not my job to be angry. It's not my job to get revenge. It's not my job to win every single battle that I face. It's my job to let God rule in my life, to let God guide me in everything that I do. To put him first and foremost. Uh, as I get ready to close up tonight, let's talk about some examples real quick. Examples of people who did not understand meekness. And you will know each one of these right offhand, won't you? In fact, if we had a blackboard up here tonight, y'all would call out these names immediately because they're exactly who comes to mind. The man named Samson, right? Judges chapter 13 through 16. A man who God's spirit was within and because of that he was powerful. Killed 600 people with the jawbone of a donkey. Able to catch 300 foxes and tie them together and light their tails on fire. I chase one cat and can't catch him. This man could do anything, right? And God had given him all this power, but he could never keep it under control. You and I today, it doesn't matter how strong we are. It does not matter how good you are at whatever occupation you've chosen if you can't keep yourself under control, you'll never be what God has called you to be. Solomon, the wisest and richest man that's ever lived. The man built the temple of the Lord. The man built even a larger palace. The man had people coming all the way from Ethiopia up the Nile River to come see him to see just how rich and how smart he is. And yet he could not keep himself under control. And he fell in love with many, many foreign wives. First Chronicles chapter 11 and verse 1. And because of that, he lost his kingdom. And he lost who he was. We continue along and we see all these people. Nebuchadnezzar, that's another one. Daniel chapter 5. And Nebuchadnezzar actually had a vision that said, Nebuchadnezzar, be careful. You're going to one day say that you're great. And because of that, God is going to turn you into a donkey. And you're going to eat grass. And you're going to grow nails like an eagle. And you're going to go mentally insane. He actually had the dream which said that. Then Daniel said that. And Daniel said, if you repent, your kingdom will keep going. And one year to the day, what did Nebuchadnezzar do? He looked over his city and said, wow, am I great. Look at how awesome I am. And then there he went. He had power, but he could not keep it under control. Today, 
We've got very intelligent, smart, powerful people who think they know better than God in matters of sexual immorality, in matters of their language, in matters of the way that they treat and love other people. And God has showered blessings upon them, multitudes and multitudes of blessings. But they don't keep themselves under control. They have not learned meekness. And because of that, they're destroyed. Now let's look at some people who have kept it under control. Of course, the one we think of, Numbers 21, verse 4, right? Moses, the meekest man in all the earth. Well, look at the context. What's happening there in Numbers 21? Aaron and Miriam, the brother and sister of Moses, say, Man, we're tired of you being in charge. They didn't like Moses. They especially didn't like Moses' wife. His wife was an Ethiopian, did not quite fit in to the Jewish idea. And so they didn't like his wife, and so they began accusing him of different things. And they said, listen, you can't be in charge anymore. We don't like the way you're running things. We don't like who you are. Moses was quiet in the midst of all these people attacking him. And because of that, God took care of him. He punished those who went against him. And made sure that he was all right. We go a little bit later. You see a man named Jesus, right? And Jesus had a temper. He was able to clear out that temple in John chapter 2. He knew when to be angry. But when he was angry, he kept himself under control. But the ultimate, ultimate use of meekness is as he hung upon that cross. And people had spit in his face. And people had beat on him. And as people had persecuted him, he cried out, Father... Forgive them of this sin, for they know not what they do. We sing a song oftentimes, he could have called 10,000 angels. Actually, the scriptures tell us he could have called legions of angels, which is many more than that. Jesus could have stopped the world, and he could have struck every one of those people dead. But he trusted God to see him through that situation. So let's bring that into today, and me, and you, and each one of us. And how does that apply to us? You and I, we have to learn each and every day how to give ourselves to God. And how to let Him reign in us. We have to give ourselves fully and completely to Him. You know, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. The last one's the hardest one. What is it? Self-control. We have to find a way in the margins of our life to leave space for God. We have to find time in the date books or the calendars that we have to leave space for God. We have to find time in our emotions and in our lives and in the things that we're doing to leave space for God. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who have power, but they use it in a way in which God would have them to use it. Are you a meek person? Do you let God control your life, not just one aspect, not just church attendance, but in the way you treat others, in the morality that you have, and the life that you live, do you give yourself completely to Jesus and let him reign in your life? Let's look at some of the sayings we've said tonight. God's not taking you this far to fail you now. God always wins. And meekness is power under control. Tonight, if the invitation applies to you, if you need to become a New Testament Christian, or if you need the prayers of the church, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.
not partaken of the Lord's Supper, uh, that opportunity is now for you if you'll go with the one designated back to the library area. Before we have our closing prayer, let's sing 346, 346. Let's sing the first and second verses of 346. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear the voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading all the stormy blast the day of his appearing will come at last he 
lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Our Father in heaven, we come before thy throne tonight. We praise thy name and we hope our worship today has been pleasing in thy sight, Father. Father, we ask you to forgive us of our unforgiven sins. Be with those things that we perhaps have done to harm someone unknowingly. If we can correct them, may it be done. We ask to be with the leaders of our country, Father, especially our president and our governors and our, also our local leaders, Father. May we always live, do the things and that you would have us do and be by the principles that are set forth in the Bible. We ask to pray for those of our number who are sick, those who are in nursing homes, those who are in hospitals, those that have had surgery and facing surgery, and also be with those who have lost loved ones, Father, and comfort them. Be with us, make us stronger tomorrow than we are today. Take our lives and mold us and make us humble and make us be the people and person you would have us be. In the end, Father, may we have lived a life that is faithful and give us a home with the loved ones that have gone before us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>